It is Wednesday, November 16th, and we are here tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin to get back to our study of Genesis. So we will be in Genesis chapter 24 tonight, so I would invite you to join me in Genesis chapter 24. We'll be there in just a few minutes. We are glad that you joined us tonight. We also want to invite you to join us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 for a Bible study and at 10.30 for the worship assembly. And if you have any questions or concerns, any comments concerning what you see or hear tonight, in the class, uh, please give us a call or send a text to 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com and we would absolutely love to hear from you. Over the past few months, my nearly eight-year-old MacBook Pro has been glitching here and there, just the occasional black screen of death and didn't think too much of it, thought, oh, I don't know what's going on there, and just kind of ignored it and restarted and kept going. But this past Sunday afternoon after worship, I tried to turn it on, and it would not accept my password. And that was a little bit strange, a little bit weird. And then I tried to restart it, and it wouldn't turn on at all. So not good at all. And so my son opened it up Sunday afternoon, and when he took out the last screw, uh, the case actually popped open as if it was under pressure and that is apparently not good at all <laughs> and on the inside he found that the uh, batteries were extremely swollen maybe on the verge of exploding or catching on fire or something like that and so that you can share in my pain I'm uh, putting a picture on the screen here, the batteries across the back of the machine, they are not supposed to look like fluffy little pillows. They should be uh, neat, very compact little bricks, kind of squared off. So uh, these are not that way at all. These are puffy pillows, and so it looks like my MacBook is uh, fried, at least for now. The batteries were actually glued in. So it's not as easy as just popping in some new ones as it is on some machines. The whole glued-in battery thing is really... Uh, turning me off of Apple products. A new comparable MacBook Pro would be more than two grand. I just kind of made a quick run down to Costco in Verona uh, Sunday afternoon. And I don't know. I don't need that in my life right now. So, um, so my son is working on building me a new-to-me ThinkPad, which will hopefully arrive here from Ohio on Friday at some point. And uh, I can tell you, I came pretty close to driving to Ohio on Monday. <laughs> Uh, to pick up the MacBook, or uh, rather the uh, the ThinkPad from the guy who was selling it on eBay. Came really close to driving over there, but uh, anyway, judged against that and decided just to wait for it to show up in the mail. Uh, but for now, I am borrowing my wife's ThinkPad, and right now at this moment, I'm starting to get just a little bit worried about what my wife may charge me for a laptop rental fee. I had her permission, but now looking back on it, I'm not sure what this is going to cost me. But I say all of this just to let you know that I am completely out of my element this week. I am completely discombobulated. If you've been through security over at the Milwaukee airport, you may notice, or may have noticed that they have a recombobulation area. Uh, after you go through security to put all your stuff back together and get back, uh, get your mind back right uh, before going on with your flight. I, I need a, a recombobulation area right now. I've been using Macs for, oh, I guess it goes back to probably second or third grade, but uh, full time for uh, the work of the church for maybe 17, 18 years now. And now tonight I'm on a Linux machine using LibreOffice. I have no idea what I am doing, and I am kind of terrified of completely reconstructing and reformatting the church bulletin over the next few days, and my sermon notes, and our worship PowerPoints, and pretty much everything else in my life. I am too old for this, so please be praying for your preacher this week and over the month or two to come. Uh, this may be a, a tough transition for an old guy. Again, I did not need this drama in my life right now. Um, but uh, the good book tells us to be thankful in everything, in every circumstance, give thanks to God. So through all of this, I am very thankful to be sharing a living space with our very own IT department. Not many people have that as a blessing in their lives, so I'm thankful for that. And I also share this to let you know that if class looks a little bit different tonight, this is why. <laughs> a completely different computer, different system, different tools, uh, different webcam in the, in the laptop, different everything used to put all of this together. I attempted to record class several times on Tuesday, and it just completely, stuff was crashing left and right. So we're going with an online version of of uh, PowerPoint tonight, so we'll see how that works. But tonight, though, we're back to the book of Genesis, which is the book of beginnings. 
a book written primarily by Moses. So this is the focus of our study over the past couple of months, at least maybe three or more months, we've been looking at the life of Abraham. So if you were here with us last week, you may remember we studied the death of Sarah at the age of 127. And I don't know how many of you were able to see it, but I put a link to an image in the description of the YouTube video last week, a link to a painting depicting the burial of Sarah in the cave of Machpelah. And I first saw this in National Geographic many years ago, and I would share it here, uh, but we're unable due to copyright restrictions. I don't need a huge fine over sharing some image I don't have permission to share. Um, but I hope you'll look it up in the description of last week's video, and if I can figure out how to do it again, <laughs> Um, I may try to po uh, post that link again in tonight's description. But anyway, in that painting, we see Sarah's body being carried into the cave by a number of servants, kind of on a stretcher, I would describe it as. And then we have Abraham, uh, quite elderly at that point, being accompanied by his son Isaac. And they're walking together, kind of comforting one another. And I think that just reminds us that Abraham and Isaac are the last ones left at this point. And so it's kind of a, a new situation. And that brings us over to Genesis chapter 24 tonight. And our first paragraph tonight is Genesis chapter 24, verses 1 through 9. Genesis 24, 1 through 9. Now Abraham was old, advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, Please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. But you will go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Suppose the woman is not willing to follow me to this land. Should I take your son back to the land from where you came? Then Abraham said to him, Beware that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my birth, and who spoke to me and who swore to me, saying, To your descendants I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you will take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this my oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant placed his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Up in verse 1, we have the reminder that Abraham is old at this point. And in my mind, he's been old for a long time in this study. He was old when we first learned about him in Scripture. But now he's really, really old. And God has been good to his family through the years. Abraham knows this. But now it's time for a new chapter in the family's history. And so maybe as he sees his own death approaching, he commissions his oldest, his most respected servant to go find a wife for his son Isaac. And I think we have the servant's name in the coming chapters, but it's really not nailed down for sure. And so we assume this is the guy that we have the name of later. So I'm just going to refer to him as the servant tonight, since that's how Moses, the author, identifies him here. So Abraham commissions his oldest, his most respective servant, go find a wife for Isaac. So Abraham has his servant take an oath. But notice, instead of a handshake, how do they affirm this oath? Notice Abraham has his servant put his hand, that is the servant's hand, under Abraham's thigh. A little bit weird, isn't it? That's a whole lot of strange going on here. And, you know, it's hard for us to even imagine this today. I'm picturing buying a house or buying a car. And the person we're buying from says, I need you to put your hand on my thigh. No, that's not going to happen. That's, but this is apparently the custom of the time. And I think we have kind of a, a similarly strange custom. Remember toward the end of Ruth as they were uh, sealing that deal? Wasn't it the, the swapping of, of sandals or sitting on a sandal? It was something like that. I didn't look that up before tonight's class. But it was kind of a strange thing, at least in our culture today. Uh, but that's what they're doing. You know, put your hand on my thigh and this will be like their version of a handshake, I suppose. And it seems that the main point of taking this oath is that the servant will find Isaac a wife. Not from among the locals, not from the Canaanites, but from among Abraham's people. And in verse 5, it seems that the servant, I think very wisely, uh, anticipates one possible issue. So I think when we're given a mission from somebody, if they tell us to do something, we kind of need to think ahead and try to think, you know, what might I run into uh, as I try to accomplish this thing and then maybe get some clarification, ask some questions. And that's what goes on here. And so the servant is wondering, well, what if the woman that I'm sent to go bring back doesn't want to come back with me? What if she's not willing to come back? 
And so Abraham clarifies that under no condition is the servant to take Isaac back to the land from which they came. And the reason is this is the land that's been promised. We don't belong back there. We belong right here. But at the same time, though, it seems that Abraham perhaps does not want Isaac influenced by the locals. He does not want Isaac marrying a local Canaanite woman. Of course, we think of what happened with a lot and how he and his family were influenced by the uh, evil behavior there in Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, Abraham very wisely does not want that to happen in his own family. Well, in the middle of verse 7, Abraham informs his servant that the Lord would send his angel before him. So in some way, God would prepare the way. God would help in this process. Over in Hebrews 1 verse 14, you may remember that angels are described as ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. And so in some sense, angels apparently work behind the scenes and they get things done. They execute God's will in a behind the scenes type way. And that's certainly what we see here. And this is the reassurance that Abraham gives and the servant agrees to this, uh, to this uh, oath. Well, let's continue on then with Genesis 24, verses 10 through 14, the next paragraph. Genesis 24, 10 through 14. Then the servant took ten camels from the camels of his master and set out with a variety of good things of his master's in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. He said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show me loving kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, please let down your jar so that I may drink and who answers, drink and I will water your camels also. May she be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown loving kindness to my master. Well, let's remember, Abraham is a very wealthy man. Many flocks and herds and camels and servants and gold and silver and all of this. And so his servant then takes 10 camels and all kinds of gifts on this journey to Nahor in Mesopotamia. And when he gets there, he has his camels kneel down by the well in the evening at the time when the women would normally come out to draw water. And as he's getting ready to try to execute this plan to find a woman for Isaac, he's ready to do some people watching. So similar to what we might do at an airport, just sitting there looking at people walking by. Only his mission is to choose one of these people. And so he's on the hunt for a bride for his master's son, Isaac. And in his favor, let's notice what he does almost as soon as he gets there. He prays and I know he is not technically maybe blood related to Abraham, but he's been in that household long enough to know this is what you do. When you face a decision, when you need help, you pray. And so this man prays. He speaks to God in his heart, and we're going to find that out later. But he asks for God's help in this prayer. In terms of a practical application of this passage for us today, if we're looking for a spouse, uh, let's realize there is a huge value in taking that situation to God in prayer. Certainly, we can pray for wisdom. We can pray for God to intervene in some way. We can ask for God to uh, work in his providence to bring us someone who will help keep us faithful to him. Whatever the case is, if we're looking for a spouse, we can pray about that. And I think that uh, the servant does a good job in doing this. And that seems to be what this man is doing on Isaac's behalf. And in this case, he tells God what he's doing. Um, <laughs> it's kind of funny to me. Um, he goes to God in prayer and then basically says, Hey God, it's me. I'm, I'm down here by this well. I'm down here by the spring of water as if God doesn't know where he is. But it's good. He, he does the best he can. God, I'm right here. I'm by this well. And in this prayer, he proposes a test of sorts. I'll start asking these young women for a drink. And whoever offers to water my camels as well, uh, that's the one. That, that'll be the test. And so just from a practical point of view, what is he testing here? You know, what is this servant really looking for with a test like this? Well, I, you know, I don't think it's some random thing, but he's looking for someone uh, with empathy. He's looking for some young woman who has the heart of a servant. He's looking for someone who is willing to go above and beyond. So he's looking for someone who's not afraid of hard work and so on. So this isn't some 
uh, you know, weird random tests. This isn't like the, the wet and dry fleeced with, with Gideon and all that. Nothing like that. Um, you know, it's not like, let me find the one who has mismatched sandals or some strange random uh, sign. Uh, but Abraham's servant is looking for a particular kind of woman for Isaac. So this will be his confirmation from God. But I'm just pointing out that there does seem to be perhaps a, a practical uh, side of this test as well. She needs to be somebody who is hospitable, who is open to helping strangers and that kind of thing. That's the person that we're looking for. So let's continue then with Genesis 24 verses 15 through 21. Genesis 24, 15 through 21. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. The girl was very beautiful, a virgin, and no man had had relations with her, and she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly lowered her jar to her hand and gave him a drink. Now when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw also for your camels until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran back to the well to draw, and she drew for all his camels. Meanwhile, the man was gazing at her in silence to know whether the Lord had made his journey successful or not. You know, I love how the servant doesn't need to search for years and years. That This is not some long, drawn-out process. But uh, the Bible says, before he had finished speaking, this young woman, Rebecca, shows up with her jar on her shoulder. And he doesn't know it yet, but we have other information here. She's the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. And you guys know I get kind of confused by family relationships any more complicated than brothers and sisters, parents and children. So I can't really explain how this young woman is related. Maybe some of you can, but I mean, I look at that list of names and the connections and I'm a little bit lost. Um, I think it's just safe to say that she is related in some distant way. At least in my mind, I like to think of her as a uh, long lost great cousin-in-law. I don't know if there is such a thing, but uh, I'm sure there's a name for that. I just don't know what it is. Uh, but the point is, she qualifies as being from Abraham's family. And remember, that was one of uh, the criteria for finding a young woman. And so as the servant is in the process of asking God to show him the way, um, she walks up with her water pot. So this is good. Um, she's beautiful. She's a virgin. She's not uh, married or previously married. She's not some part of some guy's harem. She's not a concubine. Uh, she's perfect, at least from all outward appearances. She fills her pot with water. The servant asks for a drink. She offers, and then she offers to draw water for the camels as well. And that's it. So this is the, the test. And, and she actually follows through with this. And she seems to go above and beyond. She keeps going back to the well to get multiple loads of water for the camels. Well, what do we know about camels? What makes camels unique? They drink, don't they? And they have a way of storing large amounts of water. And this guy has pretty much crossed a desert to get there, right? He came down from uh, near the Negev, kind of south of the Promised Land, and he goes around the, the Fertile Crescent, maybe crossing through some desert areas. And so the camels, they have to be thirsty at this point. So Rebecca then, she just goes to town watering uh, these camels and... Uh, some of the commentaries were pointing out that, you know, based on what an average camel can drink, and you got, you know, multi multiply that by 10 camels, that she made dozens, if not a hundred or more trips back and forth with the pot of water that she had filling the trough. So this is a huge ordeal. And in my mind, uh, Abraham's servant is just sitting there with his mouth hanging open. I can't believe it. I can't, this is the first woman, and this she's going above and beyond, that kind of thing. And I know the text doesn't tell us that, but that's the way I see it in my own mind. He's dumbfounded. He's just amazed that it's going this well. Um, the text says in verse 21 that he is gazing at her in silence. Gazing at her in silence. This is almost too good to be true. And uh, I, I taught this in my class with uh, one of the first times I ever taught the book of Genesis was to the teenagers down in Janesville shortly after we moved there. So this is back in 92, 93. And I remember asking the young men in the class, what was the, the Abraham's servant, what was he thinking as he was staring at this young woman? And one of the young men in the class uh, answered and said uh, that he was wishing that he was Isaac. 
<laughs> no, that's not what he was thinking. Uh, good try there, young man. But uh, thats uh, I don't think that's what this young man was thinking or what the servant was thinking because we do have uh, what he was actually thinking. It's almost too good to be true, and he's wondering, uh, is this young woman the one that God has in mind? So she he's, she's passed the test, but he's still, there's just a sliver of doubt there. Is this the one? And he's kind of wondering that here at this point. So let's continue with Genesis 24, verses 22 through 27. Genesis 24, 22 through 27. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring wearing, uh, weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her wrist, weighing ten shekels in gold, and said, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room for us to lodge in your father's house? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. Again, she said to him, we have plenty of both straw and feed and room to lodge in. Then the man bowed low and worshiped the Lord. He said, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master. As for me, the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. So as soon as the camels had finished drinking, as he's wondering whether this is the one, it sure seems like he's leaning toward a yes on this one. And so he whips out a rather large gold ring and uh, two much larger gold bracelets, and now he wants some more information. Uh, who are you, and can we come and stay at your house tonight? And she answers and offers not only a place to stay, but also offers plenty of straw and feed for the camels. So this is it. So this is confirming what he believes to be the case, that this is the one. He bows low, he worships the Lord, he realizes that God has arranged this, that God is behind this, that God has guided him here to his master's brothers. And just a thought question, does the text tell us how God guided him here? It doesn't, does it? God had a part to play in this, but we're really not told what it is exactly. We have no indication of uh, giant arrows appearing on the sand in the desert. We have no indication of a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. But God did, without a doubt, lead this man to Rebekah. And it wasn't obvious how he did it at the time. It only became obvious looking back on it. And I certainly think of the providential perhaps in the book of Philemon. If you're familiar with Philemon, you know it's a very short book, a one-chapter book, one of, uh, one of five one-chapter books in the uh, Bible. And it's actually a letter from Paul to a Christian slave owner on behalf of a runaway slave. And in that short letter, Paul basically makes the point that perhaps Onesimus, the slave, departed from Philemon for a moment so that he could return as a brother. And I would just note that Paul doesn't say that Onesimus ran away, but that he departed. So there's a difference, isn't there? He ran away, but Paul frames it as the slave departing. At the moment, what happened seemed pretty bad to Philemon. He lost a slave. A slave ran away. But looking back on it, in hindsight, Paul is making the point that perhaps this happened for a reason, that perhaps God played a role in it. And that's the way God's providence often happens. God provides for us, but we often don't see it, and we can't really put our finger on it. We can't nail it down until sometime later. And that seems to be what's happening here with Abraham's servant looking for a wife for Isaac. God plays a role in this process. And it might not have been clear at the time. God did not, you know, put a giant finger in the sky pointing down to this woman. But looking back on it, this servant knows that God has indeed guided him. So let's continue then with uh, Genesis 24, verses 28 through 41. Genesis 24, 28 through 41. Then the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran outside to the man at the spring. When he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrist, and when he heard the words of Rebekah his sister, saying, This is what the man said to me, he went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. And he said, Come in, blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside, since I have prepared the house and a place for the camels? So the man entered the house. Then Laban unloaded the camels, and he gave straw and feed to the camels, and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. But when food was set before him to eat, he said, I will not eat until I have told my business. And he said, Speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. 
The Lord has greatly blessed my master, so that he has become rich, and he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and servants and maids and camels and donkeys. Now Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master in her old age, and she has given him all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I live, but you shall go to my father's house and to my relatives and take a wife for my son. I said to my master, Suppose the woman does not follow me. He said to me, The Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you to make your journey successful, and you will take a wife for my son from my relatives and from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my relatives, and if they do not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. And I love how Rebecca runs home to tell her mom, or at least her mother's household, Mom, I just wanted, I just watered this uh, guy's camels, and he gave me these huge rings, and and so she's going on, and she's communicating here, and so her brother Laban hears this, and okay, as the big brother, he's got to kind of step in here, what in the world's going on here? And so he invites the servant in, he unloads the camels, gives them straw, feed, water, and all that, he brings water to wash their feet, and as he's putting food out, Notice how Abraham's servant interrupts. Basically, nope, we need to take care of this before we do anything else here. And so he gives this family history. God has been good to us, blessing Abraham with flocks and herds and gold and all this. And Sarah had a son in her old age, and I'm here to find him a wife from his people. And then he repeats the clause that if the woman refuses to go, he's free from his oath. And I love this because it really takes the pressure off of Rebecca. In other words, this is not a kidnapping, is it? This is not taking a young woman by force. This is an offer. And he's very clearly giving Rebecca and her family the power to refuse it. However, I would also point out that he also includes the bit about the angel making his journey successful. And so he's pointing out that God certainly seems to be involved in this process. So let's continue with Genesis 24, 42 through 51. Genesis 24, 42 through 51. And this is actually... I believe, the longest chapter in the book of Genesis. So there is some repetition as we hear the retelling of the story here and there throughout. But uh, Genesis 24, 42 through 51. So I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you will make my journey on which I go successful, behold, I am standing by the spring, and may it be that the maiden who comes out to draw, and to whom I say, please let me drink a little water from your jar, and she will say to me, you drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder and went down to the spring and drew. And I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly lowered her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will water your camels also. So I drank and she watered the camels also. Then I asked her and said, whose daughter are you? And she said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. And I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her wrists. And I bowed low and worshiped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had guided me in the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. So now, if you are going to deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, let me know that I may turn to the right hand or the left. Then Laban and Bethuel replied, The matter comes from the Lord. So we cannot speak to you, good, bad or good. Here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go, and let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. Obviously, again, much of this is repeated, at least for us, from our point of view. In the story, of course, Laban and the rest of Rebecca's family, they're hearing this for the first time. But this is the, the whole account of the, the servant's prayer, and Rebecca being the answer to that prayer. And I think the new information we have here in the retelling that uh, we didn't have originally is that Abraham's servant put the ring in Rebecca's nose. We have a nose ring in the Bible. Uh, this is the first and I believe the only reference to a nose ring in the Bible. However, uh, we do have a reference to a snout ring in the Bible. Um, if you could see the stuff that I search for, if you could see my search history in my Bible program, <laughs> you might be shocked. I was searching today for nose ring, nose and ring, nose ring in quotes, and uh, could only find this one, and I'm like, there's something else in there, and so I searched for snout ring, snout ring, and there it was. So this is uh, Proverbs 11.22. King Solomon says, As a ring of gold in a swine's snout, so is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. 
and I just get a kick out of that. Uh, Solomon has had a lot of experience with a lot of women, and uh, that is his comparison. So this is the first nose ring in the Bible, uh, but we should also at least be aware that there, there is a snout ring later in the Bible in uh, Proverbs 11:22. But back to our text in verse 49, Abraham's servant basically calls for a decision. If this sounds good, let me know. If not, let me know. Either way, let me know. Um, so I'll know whether to turn to the right or to the left. In other words, I need to make a decision. I need to know which way to go. Do I leave? Do I stay? Do I take care of this or not? And Laban or Laban very wisely sees that this is from the Lord. And so as the older brother, in a way, he kind of removes himself from that decision-making process and pretty much puts it back on the Lord. Take her and go. Let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. So let's continue with Genesis 24, verses 52 through 61. Genesis 24, 52 through 61. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. The servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. When they arose in the morning, he said, Let me, or send me away to my master. But her brother and her mother said, Let the girl stay with us a few days, say ten, afterward she may go. He said to them, Do not delay me, since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the girl and consult her wishes. Then they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Thus they sent away their sister Rebekah and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men. They blessed Rebekah and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. Then Rebekah arose with her maids, and they mounted the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebekah and departed. Up in verse 52, once again, Abraham's servant worships God. There's a lot of worship in this chapter. He bows to the ground before the Lord, and now he really brings out the gifts. Now that they've accepted the offer, silver, gold, clothing, he gives these things to Rebekah. He also gives these things to her brother and to her mother. Uh, Abraham's servant spends the night. In the morning, he's ready to leave, but Rebekah's family wants her to stay another 10 days or so. And uh, that's absolutely understandable. Uh, they will most likely never see her again. Um, but the servant wants to head out. And so the family asks Rebecca, and she's willing to go. So they send her away along with the nurse. Thanks to a sermon that my dad preached back in 2011, I know that the servant's name or the nurse's name is Deborah. And I believe she is the first of two Deborahs in the Bible. We actually read about her death in Genesis 35, verse 8. That's how we know her name. But since she's mentioned by name, this nurse must have had quite an impact on the whole family. They mourned for her at her passing. In fact, when they buried uh, Rebecca's nurse, they renamed the place of her burial something like a place of weeping or a place of mourning. And so that's just interesting. And so I'm thankful to uh, Dad for giving some input on tonight's lesson. We have just a, a nurse is listed here as going with Rebecca, but uh, based on that other passage, uh, we actually know that her name is Deborah. And then they give a blessing. Their hope and prayer is that she become the uh, that she become thousands of ten thousands, and that her descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. I don't think we have a record of Abraham's servant specifically mentioning God's promise to Abraham. But we certainly seem to have an allusion to it here. And I'm thinking that certainly that must have come up in that discussion the previous evening. And so that's their blessing to their sister. In verse 61, they pack up and they head out for the promised land. Uh, let's conclude the longest chapter of Genesis tonight with uh, Genesis 24, verses 62 through 67. Genesis 24, 62 through 67. Now Isaac had come from going to Bir Laharoi, for he was living in the Negev. Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, camels were coming. Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. She said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, He is my master. Then she took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. And he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. 
Thus Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Well, like his father, Isaac also seems to be doing some wandering of his own now. He's out there near the Negev, that desert area south of the Promised Land, uh, most likely caring for flocks. And he sees camels coming, so uh, Rebecca then sees Isaac. She confirms this is her future husband. She covers herself with a veil. And this is it. We don't have a record of the actual wedding or what those customs might have been like. But Isaac brings her into his mother's tent. He loves her. And this brings him some comfort after his mother's death. Um, as a dad, I, I think I've earned the privilege of telling dad jokes here and there. And what I'm about to say might qualify, might fall in that category. So I need you to prepare yourselves for this. In verse 64, in the King James Version, I believe we may have the first reference to smoking in the Bible. As the text says that Rebecca lighted off the camel. Rebecca lighted off the camel. I am so sorry about that. That has been stuck in my brain for many years, and I have been looking forward to sharing that for a long time. So uh, there it is. Hope you still love me. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of Genesis chapter 24. Isaac is married, and this obviously gets us one step closer to Abraham's descendants being numbered like the sand of the seashore. You can't do that without Isaac connecting here. And so we see that connection. We see that uh, new relationship, that, uh, that marriage start uh, in tonight's class. In terms of practical application of this chapter, it seems we may have a few lessons on finding a spouse. In fact, as I was preparing for tonight's class, I looked in my folder on Genesis chapter 24, and I actually found an article from the World Evangelist Periodical. This is dated November 2001, and it has the title, is it a sin to use a dating service? Is it a sin to use a dating service? And then I noticed that the article was written by my dad, Ray Exum. And they've got his picture there by that article. So I don't know how this came to be. Apparently somebody had asked the question and he answered it by looking at the example of Isaac finding Rebecca in Genesis chapter 24. Uh, by the way, he did not say that it was a sin to use a dating service. But he emphasized the importance of prayer, just as Abraham and his servant prayed. And so the point is, as parents, we need to be praying for this. And uh, then Dad emphasized that Abraham and his servant actually did something to help Isaac find a wife. They didn't just sit around and wait for Rebecca to show up. Uh, in a sense, Abraham's servant is the dating service, isn't he? He goes on this mission to go out and find a wife uh, for Isaac. And then the final point in that article that Dad made was that he emphasized the importance of finding a spouse who shares our faith. And then he gave a few examples, a few ideas concerning how to do this, specifically by visiting some area congregations of the Lord's people. You find a Christian by going where Christians go. So you can attend a lectureship, a Bible school type lectureship, go to a Christian college to get an education, visit area congregations, go to polishing the pulpit or some event where other Christians hang out. Uh, this past week, I attended one night of the gospel meeting with J.K. Hamilton down at the church in South Beloit, about two blocks over the state line. And uh, there were Christian people there, including some Christian young adults uh, from other congregations uh, in the area, coming from Churches of Christ as far away as Rockford and Milwaukee. And um, I'm just saying, if you are looking for a faithful spouse, that may be one good place to start. It is not a sin to marry an unbeliever, uh, but it may not be wise. So we need to be aware of that, be aware of the difficulties. And I would just point out there is a difference between something being unwise and something being a sin. It is not a sin to marry a, an unchristian or non-Christian spouse. Uh, but we need, do need to think through that. We do need to be aware of our influence and uh, the influence that's being exerted on us over the rest of our lives. But anyway, I'm thankful for uh, Dad and his input in tonight's class through that article. And uh, hopefully next week we can continue with Genesis 25 as we come to the death of Abraham. But thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 930 as we continue our study of Isaiah. And I think we're right near the end of that study. This is a two-part series, 13 weeks in each one. I think we're right near the end of this series, at least Isaiah part one. And then after class on Sunday, let's come together for the worship assembly at 1030 as well. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. 
Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are a God who loves us. You are a God who answers prayer. Tonight, we pray for those who may be considering marriage at some point in the future. We pray for those who are considering marriage, that they would be influenced by your wisdom and your guidance in some way, that you would take care of them through your providential care. We pray for open doors and opportunities. We also pray tonight for those who are newly married, that you would bless those relationships with love and with strength, and that they would be faithful to you for the rest of their lives. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus we pray. Amen.